Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. My name is Derek Lambert and I'm the host. Today we're going to be touching on a, a really sensitive topic. It's not sensitive to us, but it's sensitive to many people who have kind of a conspiratorial mindset, and that is the Kabbalah. What is the historical context? What is the Kabbalah? When was it written? See, the who, what, when, where, why, how, all of that is so important when we investigate this literature because it has been weaponized against minority groups such as Jews, and there are bad actors in all of this literature. Dr. Justin Sledge will point this out. There is nothing to shy away from. But when you see people use this kind of literature in modern day period or even in history, such as the Nazis and such, who were running into this kind of material, trying to use it against Jews, you have to be very critical. Bring your skepticism to this, uh, to this kind of propaganda that is used against people. Because I want to know what it is. Where was this written? Who was this intended for? What were they trying to convey? And what's the meaning behind it? That's what we're going to try and discuss today with Dr. Justin Sledge. And I hope that you stick around, stay tuned, hit the like button, share this content to somebody who thinks this somehow predicts the next presidential election or something, and uh, stay tuned for the ride. I appreciate you all. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Thank you to everybody who's hitting the like button and who's sticking around for Dr. Justin Sledge. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well, Derek. It's great to be back on Myth Vision. Uh, it's been a little while. It's great to be back on. We always appreciate your presence here and always learn something new. And I know a lot of people walk away from your videos just blown away, especially me on your recent Yahweh video. I said, wow, this was a, it is a very complicated uh, matter of trying to discover where Yahweh comes from. And, and I've talked to some scholars, one of them, I can't remember his name. He's in South Africa. And like, it is so complicated if you really, so what you, you had simplified it and popularized it in such a way that video has gone viral. Where's it at in views right now? Oh, I don't even know. I mean, uh, maybe North of six. Almost eight, almost seven hundred thousand views. Yeah, yeah, it's done quite well. <laughs> uh, yeah, it did, it did quite well, and you know, and I think it, it's doing quite well because it's a very challenging idea, and and that speaks to people's character. They want to be challenged, and um, you know, and again, I, I don't uh, don't pretend that the video does anything more than just sort of lay out kind of where the the rough consensus of scholarship is. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, what part a great deal of what the video is, and a lot, I think a lot of what people were dissatisfied with it about it is that we don't know. And, you know, we don't know what we don't do, at least in my opinion, is we don't say, well, the Bible says this, so it must be that. Right. Uh, the Bible's just one one piece of evidence um, yeah. that we can add to the pile. And um, so, yeah, so it's in that way, it's, it's a quite a complicated, um, it's not a quite, it's, it's quite a complicated question. And it's complicated by the fact that, uh, you know, the great Bronze Age collapse doesn't make anything any clearer. We just have so little evidence. And, 
where it seems that Yahweh came, came, came from was not a terribly developed area. And so there aren't written texts and there's not much archaeological evidence. There's so many interesting things about that, too. I mean, it is a mystery to try and figure out, but that mystery allows so many people to, I would say, even wiggle out of problems. But even if they did discover where exactly it came from, there would, they'd find another way if they're trying hard enough. Um, subscribe to Dr. Justin Sledge's YouTube channel, Esoterica. Dr. Sledge has a website as well where you can go, and there's a lot of ways to contact or buy books from him. He, you're always doing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just actually also dealing uh, antiquarian rare books on topics in occultism. I actually have a new catalog coming out here in the next few weeks. Uh, so I'm have a, um, a a good chunk of books from the 17th century coming in, which will be which are some pretty cool ones, I think. Um, so if folks are interested in that kind of thing, I'm also a dealer in antiquarian occult books. Nice. And then you also have the Patreon, Patreon. I always say Patreon. Um but you know i think i say patreon like, too i don't know what the I, I think the right way to say it is that people understand you and sign up i think if, if they understand you and sign up you said it correctly <laughs> so yeah if you love what dr justin sledge is doing go and sign up um and i i, I just googled right i was like conspiracy theories surrounding kabbalah and of course there's always somebody and I noticed why conspiracy theories keep turning into Jewish mysticism from early Nazis to modern day MAGA, et cetera. But uh, I just thought this was interesting in this like little clip. I'm not going to play it. Um, at, at Klepper's urging, she types a few phrases into her mystical, all seeing Gematria ca calculator phone app. The phrase, America is in a bad place, she finds yields the same Gematria value as Let's Go Brandon. Now famous coded catchphrase used to decry President Joe Biden. She grins triumphantly. Do you have goosebumps yet? She asks uh, Klepper. He looks incredulous. Clearly for this subject or for his subject, this lady, there's only one possible meaning. Anyway, I, I want to get into the to the nitty gritty details here and first ask you, um, what makes you uh, an expert to be able to even tell us what this book is about? So the Kabbalah, you mean? Yes. Yeah. So the, the Kabbalah isn't, isn't, isn't one book, just to, uh, to be clear. It's actually a, a, a tradition. In fact, it just is the Hebrew word for uh, to receive, right? So the, the, the name for the service that we do on Friday nights for, uh, for uh, welcoming the Sabbath is called Kabbalah Shabbat, the welcoming, the, the receiving of the Sabbath. So Kabbalah just means the ones the, to receive, and people who do Kabbalah are the receivers, is literally what the word straightforwardly means in, in Hebrew. Of course, it means more than that now. But why am I an expert? Um, I've studied this material academically. I've, I have, uh, there's only one place really in the world that, grant, that it grants degrees in um, the academic study of Western esotericism. And uh, that's the University of Amsterdam. And I graduated from there. In fact, I'm going back there this summer to do some, uh, probably do some work with the, the library there and, and uh, the university. So there are very few places in the world that grant a degree in this kind of material, and I have one of those degrees. So that's, um, so that's, I guess that's that. Um, and I, I tend to specialize in Kabbalah, mostly in um, the early modern uptake of, of Kabbalah into the sort of occult world. So that would be the transformation of Jewish Kabbalah into Christian Kabbalah, and then the uptake of Christian Kabbalah into what we now know as Western esotericism. So folks in the chat may know people like Johannes Ruchlin, um, uh, Della Porta, Giovanni uh, Francisco Della Porta, John D, Gino Bruno. So there's some luminary figures in the history of Western occultism are all very much informed deeply. Aleister Crowley, of course, um, very informed by the Kabbalah. So there's just no doing Western occultism without reference to uh, without without reference to the Kabbalah. So that's typically where I, I tend to enter into it, but. I study the whole, the whole, uh, the whole Megillah uh, to, to mix my metaphors. So you told us what the word means. And of course, it seems there's a practice behind this, uh, this literature. There's kind of a tradition. What is it? Yeah. So this is where things get really complicated really fast. Um, so Kabbalah is, um, it's a form of Jewish mysticism. It's important to point out that um, Judaism has existed a long time uh, in various iterations. And that there have been forms of Jewish mysticism that existed prior to Kabbalah. So Kabbalah is not all of Jewish mysticism, but Kabbalah is a form of Jewish mysticism. Uh, previous forms of uh, mysticism that existed before the Kabbalah were things like Merkava mysticism, where you would um, 
descend into the various palaces of God to become enthroned on the divine throne. You could become transformed into an angel like happens in third, um, third Enoch. It seems that Paul was familiar with this form of mysticism and, um, second Corinthians, he mentioned someone who was caught up to the third heavens. That's all very Merkava language. Um, so that was the dominant form of Jewish mysticism for about 800 years. And then what, what begins to happen is that new forms of Jewish mysticism are pioneered. Um, primarily around uh, a text called the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation. And the Book of Formation is a very short, enigmatic work that we don't know when it was produced, 7th, 8th century. This describes the mechanism by which God spoke the world into being. And it focuses very heavily on language and uh, alphabet mysticism. And in that text, um, the primary modes by which God created the world are these things called spherot. We don't, this word is complete neologism. It's related to the word for to count, but it's not the word for number. Mispar is the word for number in Hebrew. So the spherot are not numbers, but there's something related to numbers. Sometimes I translate it numericalities. It's a weird, really weird word to translate. But at any rate, there begins to be a speculation, intense speculation on these spherot, these emanations of, of, the, of the Godhead or these mechanisms by which God created the world. And by the 13th century, this speculation on these spherot uh, produces a book called the Sefer Bahir, the Book of Brilliance, uh, which is sort of a midrash or a commentary, finding these spherot in the Bible and then sort of exegetically building them out into a form of mysticism. And then the real explosion of Kabbalah is going to be in the late 13th century with a text called the Zohar, the Sefer Zohar. This is a monumental, it's a massive text. You can see it over my shoulder there. Uh, three volumes, that's uh, that's the Zohar there in a very tiny little dense script. The English translation, if you want to know, is about 12 volumes, 12 thick. You know, it's a huge, it's a huge text. Mm. Um, so that text, the Zohar, is where the, the Kabbalah, as we know it, really uh, is foundationally developed. And then from there, there's later interpretations of it. Uh, Isaac Luria and other folks in the 16th century will develop it further. And there'll be an entire theosophy that's developed out of um, the understanding of the, of the Zohar. And that entire theosophy becomes the Kabbalah as we know it, as developed by Itzhak Luria and his, uh, his disciple, mostly Chaim Vital. So if you want to think about it, what it, if you want to think about a parallel to sort of what it is, imagine if a new kind of scripture was discovered in Christianity in the Middle Ages. And that's what this book claims to be. It claims to be a book actually written in the second century that goes back to Sinai. We know that historically it doesn't. Is it fair uh, to just jump in there and say this is kind of what the uh, the Jews who are becoming uh, the Babylonian Talmud or the Jerusalem Talmud are kind of stretching their tradition back, assuming they go back to Moses, that similar tradition? kind For of sure, idea. for sure. The idea, right, that all this is ultimately going back to Moses. And not um, saying there wasn't some form of a tradition of something, but they're trying to lay claim to the the kind of like the apostolic tradition right. you know, oh, we yeah. go back to but you know. we go back to our church goes back to saint thomas and that's why we're you know uh, the thomas christians in egypt or, or what have you yeah it's it's a way of legitimating uh authority and you do it by linking your linking your text to some really really ancient idea we know that the zohar was not produced in the second century like we can tell that from the the we can tell it from the internal uh, evidence inside the text uh, Orthodox people will maintain that it goes back to the second century. And really they'll say it was revealed in the second century, but it goes back to Sinai. Um, that's not true. <laughs> um, and so what you have to imagine is that it, the Kabbalah is a series of traditions that have grown up around these texts and the practices that uh, come with them. And just to give you some general idea about how uh, rich this literature is and how complicated it is, uh, we just did on my channel, uh, my buddy Zevi and I from Seekers of Unity, we just did a, um, we just did a study of a very small part, right? It's, it's about four pages in the original Aramaic. And it took us uh, nine sessions and about 13 and a half hours reading them out loud and then working through the logical and scriptural and metaphysical implications of what it all meant. Uh, it took us about 13 and a half hours of live streams to get through what is equivalent to about four, four and a half, five pages of the original Aramaic of the Zohar. So you're talking about a text that runs into the hundreds of pages, thousands of pages. Um, it's incredibly complicated and very, very dense.
So there's layers to this and it's not just simple, but it's a mystical practice. Um, can you give us a little more about, uh, like if I, if I were to say what Christianity or what the new Testament might teach you, you'd get a, you'd get a ton of different flavors. If I were mm -hmm. to use it as ice cream, you'd, you'd have mysticism, you'd have theology, you'd have, I'd say legend, you'd say there there's multiple things going on in this literature. Um, but there are people who read it, who pray over it, who meditate over it, who take it as practical wisdom on how to act, how to behave. Is this something you could almost say is going on here, but is it more mystical? If you were to put how much percentage of weird mysticism stuff's going on and what does that even mean? What does yeah. it even mean to be mystical? Yeah. So, um, basically the idea, right, is that the Zohar takes for granted that you've basically, Kabbalah takes for granted that you've mastered rabbinical Judaism which is to say you have a, a firm understanding of the Bible in the original language languages. Uh, you have a firm understanding of rabbinical literature. Um, so that says that the Talmuds, of course, there are two, and the Midrash literature, which of which there's a library. So it just takes that for granted, right? So if you don't have that, you're lost. Uh, it just it speaks that. And so the basic argument that the, the, the Kabbalah makes is that beneath the Bible, uh, the Torah specifically, beneath the plain meaning of the, of the text, there's actually not just the plain meaning, there's a hidden sublayer. And that hidden sublayer is actually a glimpse into a into the world of the divine manifesting itself in reality. And so as the God becomes God and as God expresses God's self in the world, it's a very pantheistic system of emanations. Mm -hmm. Insofar as that's happening, the Torah is is a is basically a code for telling you how that's happening. And so the trick is you have to learn to not only retreat, read between the lines, but you have to learn to read beneath it. And so, um, and so this is, for instance, why Hebrew and Aramaic are, are essential to this process. You can't really read it in English and get the, the full sense of it because they're reading things hyper literally. So I'll give you an example of, of this just in the first lines of the, of the, uh, of the book of Genesis, right? Right. In, in English, we just see in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right. Kabbalah says, nope, too fast. Bereshit bara et, right? So take the first three words of the Hebrew of the Hebrew, Bereshit, right? At at the beginning, literally on the head. So read it on the head. Bara created et. Well, what was created, right? Oh, it was ba on the head. That's what the subject is, which is not the way that sentence is grammatically structured. But they're like, no, it, can't, it has to be read that way. And it created what? Bara what? It created et. Now, et doesn't get translated into English. It's just a, a direct object marker in Hebrew. It tells you the thing coming after that is a direct object. They're like, no, no word in Hebrew is superfluous. So it's et, aleph, tav, the entire Hebrew alphabet. So what is the first thing that was created out of the divine mind? The Hebrew alphabet. And it's from there that everything else is constructed. So it's an incredibly complicated, multi-layered, um, hermeneutical system, among other things, um, by which mystical Jews both interpret the Bible, but also how to live their lives. I mean, it, it also has implications for how one lives one's life. It has implications for uh, how one practices the law. For instance, we think of mysticism as kind of like hippy dippy, like, you know, you just like wear crystals and you do hippie stuff or whatever. You like, you kind of, you know, tune out. Uh, Kabbalah is also extremely strict in its practice of Jewish law. And so um, it is a it is a very very strict form of of Jewish practice, where not only is the law commanded by God to do it, but it's actually part of making um, it's part of actually realigning the cosmos itself. So if uh, for folks who are Jewish in the chat or whatever, if you've ever been in New York or somewhere where there are a lot of a big Jewish population, you often see guys Hasidic guys with the black coats and the hats. And they'll be out on Friday afternoons and they'll be just asking random Jewish people, random people, hey, are you Jewish? And if you answer yes, they'll ask you, have you put on tefillin today? The boxes that go on the arms and on the head. And the answer is, if you say, yes, I am Jewish, and you say, no, I haven't put them on, then they'll stop you and say, hey, could you take five minutes and put these on? Now, why would two random Hasidic guys care whether you've committed, whether or not you've performed a commandment in the Bible? Because they believe, as part of Kabbalah, that when a Jew practices the law, especially that law, it has metaphysical implications. It, it, hastenings the, it hastenings the coming of the Messiah or something like that. 
so this is a place where um again it's it's it changes people's lives like there are people out kind of doing missionary work but missionary work not to non-jews but to jews try to get them to be more jewish it's it's interesting because let's let's take jordan peterson for example everything has a meta narrative um, and he kind of applies a, a, his own esoteric system when he's interpreting stuff. And for me, I, I, I've, I'm more into the historical reality of what things really mean, what they really say, even though it's interesting to learn how people can read between the lines or come up with these things. And I personally would look at pa patternicity and see how fanciful we can come up with things in our context through our own experiences and then it's like with numbers, you can make numbers mean anything, right? You can make words and letters mean anything if you try hard enough. And I think that that might be what's going on in some of these situations where oh, we're, we're sure. really uh, interpreting things in such a way that does that. So um, it's it's gotten used. It's, it's being used in so many different ways. So it might be good to anchor this into its original context for a moment. Um, do you think that the, the Kabbalah was meant to be just like on end, like to be kind of reinterpreted forever? Or is there a historical cultural context in which this thing was anchored and we can kind of dispel nonsense from what they may have intended it initially? Or is there somewhere of knowing that? Yeah, well, we know where the principal text of the Kabbalah was written. It was written in northern Spain, um, in the area um, around a guy named Moshe de Leon and his circle. It's produced sometime in the 1270s, 1270s, 1280s. So we know that's the context in which it was produced. Um, we don't know why it was produced. We don't know why they did this. It, it you know, it, um, it's a very strange kind of production. Um, we have there's some scholarly speculation about what prompted this. Um, there were some forms of mysticism that seemed to have involved uh, appearances of the prophet Elijah. And this may have, there may have been sort of a spurning on of this. But what we do know is that the the context there is one in which, um, you know, Jews are living in a majority Christian culture. They're living in a hostile Christian culture, right? This is the world of Spain. This is the world that will give birth to the Inquisition in a, in a little while. This is not a you know cozy world. This is will become the world of the Reconquista pretty soon, and um, there were in many cases, and just this is true in historical cases with, with the history of Judaism in general, that when things get bad, messianic expectation goes up. Right, the worse things get, the more likely you think it is the Messiah is about to come and save you from everything. Um, you see this in the Second Temple period. You see this, so you know, you see it in the Black Death. You see it, you know, uh, over and over again. So there probably was some messianic expectation, and they thought maybe these visions and things they were receiving were part of this sort of imminent coming of the Messiah. And um, again, the worse things get, the more God's in control. That's kind of the logic of apocalypticism. And after the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492, uh, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of refugees, you know, basically told to convert or die. Um, and they were expelled and eventually settled in, in Israel and, and Salonika uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And it's there that they really went full tilt on this idea that by publicizing the Kabbalah, they would basically hasten the coming of the Messiah, that this was sort of the last piece of the puzzle. And um, that's how the, the Kabbalah became, went from being a very, very esoteric text among a very tightly select few group of elite rabbinical scholars to being disseminated widely into the population. This, of course, led to the, to the, um, in some ways led to the disaster of the whole false messiah Shabbat V and all the things that have come along with that, uh, which is grist for the mill for conspiracy theorists and yeah. um, uh, Shabbat V and some of his followers. But so that's the, basically the arc. It's born really in 13th century uh, Spain, at least the principal text is, but it gets popularized beginning in the 16th century in the Ottoman Empire. And that is all tied up with messianic expectations um, and the idea that um, this terrible you know, tragedy. And again, it's something interesting and people often forget this because we typically have this weird view that Jews and Muslims don't get along or something like that. There's a, it's taking the Palestinian Israeli conflict and writing it through all of history, which is right. just not the case. Um, but people forget, and he doesn't get the credit for it, but uh, Bayez II, the Ottoman uh, uh, Sultan, when, you know, the Spanish were kicking the Jews out, he realized that these people were an incredible asset 
in terms of literature and learning and being doctors. And he sent his entire fleet to pick them up. Uh, he picked up a ton of refugees, brought them back to the Ottoman Empire. And people often don't remember that uh, there were no printing presses in the Ottoman Empire until one was established by a Jewish family in Salonika in 1495. So, so he was right. And, and the, you notice the meteoric rise in some ways of the Ottoman Empire. After that, they, they just basically import a, an intellectual class. Um, and also think about Spain's fortunes um, in the aftermath of, of those kinds of things. So I think that, um, that, you know, that kind of cultural trauma um, fed into the, into the Zohar and, and the Kabbalah in a lot of ways. And that explains a lot of the sort of uh, pretty gross xenophobic um, anti-Gentile language that you see through the, through the Kabbalah, which is unfortunate, but you know, I don't get the, I don't have the right nor the ability to change history and censor what I don't like or what I don't agree with. And it's certainly there, but it has a historical context and the historical context is, well, would you have a terribly high opinion of the Christians around you who are forcibly converting your people and exiling you and things. You would, you would have a low opinion of them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> I guess it would be a different situation for me if I saw a huge population of people in the world who gravitated toward that negative kind of anti-Gentile type thing. And it was really making a major impact that was obvious, but instead it's almost like divine hiddenness. <laughs> You might find a few rabbis who are radical out there that are saying stupid, spewing nonsense, you know, that is literally, you know, somehow they relate to that, to that rhetoric in sure. their own world. But uh, for I mean, the most part, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking about a bunch of like, it's the equivalent of, you know, making the Taliban um, the spokesperson for all of Muslims or making the Ku Klux Klan the spokesperson for all of Christians. Right. Um, you're talking about, you know, Jews let make up less than a 1% of the world's population and Haredi Jews make up, uh, less than, uh, half a percent of, of that. You know, it's a, it's a tiny yeah. group of people at the, at the end of the day, they're just a tiny group of people who have to record themselves and put themselves on the internet saying hateful stuff in the name of Judaism. And, yeah. um, uh, I didn't I, want I, to get caught up in it, but I, it's good to address. I mean, what I do find interesting about Jewish history and these books is they are, they're, even Jews who see that and say that was bad, we don't agree with that, like have that documented in their history and they keep it around. They want people to see the good, the bad, the ugly, the debates that are going on through the Talmud. And they, like, you, you know, you, you see all the voices that are taking place and it's documented for you to look at. And so, yeah, we don't, we don't tend to deal with our heretics by silencing them. We tend to deal with our heretics by printing what they say so that other Jews can look at what they say and go, well, that guy's crazy. Um, you know, you, you, it's easy to corn. The easiest way to quarantine people is by what, what is called religious expose. If you really want to, if you really want to, if you want a person to shut up, let them talk. Cause eventually no one's going to listen to them if they're saying insane things. Um, and of course, then they'll complain about being deplatformed and things like that. When you know, there are consequences to the bizarre things that you say, or the hateful right. things that you say, you get deplatformed and all of a sudden the world's against you and it's all grist for the mill of your conspiracy theories. But, um, yeah, the worst heretics in all of Jewish history, we record right alongside the rest. And the idea is uh, the truth will out over time. And, uh, right. you know, hateful stuff like that is just not going to make the cut eventually. Okay. And even the rabbis of the time look at some of these other rabbis and go, this guy's nuts. Um, <laughs> so could you give an example that you can think of? Or I mean, The most famous example is Shimon Bar Yochai. I mean, Shimon Bar Yochai in the Talmud... Um, He's the worst of sort of the anti-Roman, uh, anti-Gentile uh, bigots. Um, it, and again, he's living under Roman oppression. He was himself personally oppressed. You know, he, you know, he, you know, he was a, um, he was a hardcore Jewish partisan. You know, he was one of the, he was an extremist. We would call him, I think you would liken him very much to, um, I don't know, Mullah Omar from the Taliban. Uh, he was sort of the Mullah Omar of, of the Jews. Um, now he was very righteous, but so was Mullah Omar. I mean, you, you can be religiously righteous and still be a jackass. <laughs> yeah. um, and he was very righteous and very religiously righteous, I suppose. And yeah, he famously said things like, a snake and a Gentile have the same thing in common. They're both better with their heads cut off. Oh. Um, you know, and this is the kind of thing that is in the Talmud. Um, again, we don't censor it. It's there. You can read it. Uh, and it is hateful and bad. And I don't agree with Shimon Bar Yochai. And the other rabbis of the time were like, no, like you can't have that kind of attitude with the Romans because at the end of the day, the Romans are a mixed bag. Like 
they actually provide a lot for us. And, you know, we are better off with their infrastructure and being part of their empire because they keep us safe at night. Hmm. Like it's a complicated mixed bag. And so you have some rabbis that were very much part of the establishment, didn't want anything to do with the revolution, didn't want anything to do with the rebellion. Many of them were murdered by the rebels. Um, that's the part that goes unquoted. And then there were, of course, these, you know, hardcore Roman, uh, anti-Roman uh, bigots, anti-Gentile bigots. Um, and yeah, he gets quoted. Now, of course, you know, because he's associated with mysticism, he goes on to play a prominent role in the Zohar. Uh, he's the lead rabbi of the Zohar. So again, it's all about sort of like, you know, uh, how these texts are read and what context they're read. What are the historical circumstances by which, um, by which they're read? You know, I, again, like if you take someone like, Malcolm X and um, you know, Malcolm X had plenty of hard things to say about white people, but is it unreasonable to say hard things about white people in like the 1960s when you get right. dogs attached on you and you know, dogs attacking your people and people bombing your churches and killing little girls. And it's not an unreasonable position, even right. if it is a regrettable one. And also if we quote uh, Malcolm X out of context early on in his life, as opposed to later in his life, where he was much more, uh, you know, much more interested in working with with white people on, on the question of civil rights and stuff like that. So, context matter, historical circumstance matters. Um, and with the Zohar, it's really important, you know, how this, when this text was produced, how it was produced, what it's meant to do, who's building it now, um, mm -hmm. you know. And again, you take a bunch of Haredi ultra orthodox rabbis from Bnei Brak, who are living in a completely insular world that's not, has no contact with the outside world. And if you take them to be representative of all of Judaism, it's like taking some tribal Muslims from Afghanistan who live in constant contact with war and be like, oh yeah, their interpretation of jihad is the only legitimate one. Right. Uh, right it's just right. a complete misreading and oversimplification of a very complicated affair. And isn't it fair, and before we go to Super Chats, isn't it fair to say that what what happens when we do that we're making all of the people who identify with this particular name for this religion or this group, whatever they might be, we're lumping them in. And this is honestly a horrible uh, approach to understanding these things, like finding radical Muslims and saying all Islam is this. I mean, sure, you can find ugly things. And I, I, I mean, look, I've done this, right? There's a lot of people who are what people call Islamophobes, right? But I have I have criticism of all religion, including Islam, and even have Muslim friends. So, like, what do you think we should do is more of a practical thing. I'm asking a Jewish question here, not so much of a mental ascent kind of thing. What should we do, Dr. Sledge, to mitigate that from happening? Do you think more compartmentalizing should take place? Do you think we should try to uh, stop making things uh, what, what was the term? They're all under one umbrella. Um, thinking, uh, I, can't, I can't even think of the term, but what, what do you think we should do about it? I mean, I think one, I think communities need to call out members of their communities who are bad actors. I think that when you see people in your community doing bad stuff and saying evil things and call them out on it, like, um, cause it has to be, you, you have to clean your side of the street first. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, it can't be me being like, Oh, Islam has a violence problem. I'm like, no, I can say that Judaism has a xenophobia problem. Like Orthodox Judaism has a xenophobia problem that's rooted in the Torah. Mm -hmm. It's it's in there, right? The idea of chosenness, the idea of, you know, unique blessings, the idea of all this stuff. Like, I think those are all toxic ideas, frankly. Um, I think they lead to, uh, to feelings of ethnic superiority and stuff like that. So it's not for me to tell Muslims what they should and shouldn't do. I, they, they have to clean up their side of the street and ditto the Christians and the Buddhists or whoever else. It's not like, you know, I agree with you. Uh, all the religions have have blood on their hands and mud on their face. And so for me, it's taking a hard look at my tradition and, you know, cherishing what's wonderful and great about it, but also being like, you know, dragging it when you drag it, because that's, uh, to me, that's the only responsible way to deal with, with the tradition. You have to deal with it warts and all. And, you know, I, over my channel, my buddy Zevi and I, um, we just studied, the Zohar, you know, continuously on live stream for the 13 and a half hours. You know, we just like went through every single line of the text. Uh, there's a whole playlist of uh, just the us studying the Zohar. And yeah, we went through the whole thing. And when we got to the parts that were really beautiful and amazing, we covered those and we were really happy with those. And we covered the parts about why the Midianites and the Moabites need to be destroyed and how the Moabites and the Midianites are really the Gentiles or whatever. 
Yeah, we covered all that and it was not pleasant and it's really gross to have your dirty laundry aired in public, but that's it. You can't, you got to air your dirty laundry and uh, you got to admit it's dirty and you got to do the work of, of owning it and do the work of saying, yeah, this is something we need to study. We study it not to emulate it. We study it not to be like that, to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors. And we study it to be honest and open and transparent about what's there in the, in the tradition. Thank mm. you. So I can't imagine other, any other ways that you could, you could, you could cover it. I mean, you could, dis all, I guess you could just say, well, let's just disavow all religion. But uh, I think that's at least for me, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I'm not prepared to do that, but I'm also not prepared to sugarcoat a tradition or um, uh, or sugarcoat a, a, a history and just ignore the things that are gross and bad. We spent, I mean, people say things like, oh, the Jews hide the Kabbalah. I'm like, look, ma'am, we spent 13 and a half hours reading the damn thing out loud and studying it line by line. What, what, what else do you want us to do? Like, I, yeah. I found that, that, uh, when we did a stream before and you were calling out bigotry and stuff within your own, like the in within Jewish literature, right. Supremacy stuff, things like that. And, um, it wasn't enough for some commenters. No, because uh, they just, they just, because it's just anti-Semitism. They just don't want us to exist. Literally. Like yeah. you could say, yep, that was ugly. Yep. That's wrong in the literature. We should change. Nope. Slavery has been abolished. We, or at least, you know, we would want to see more of that happen because it's still a thing in the world we live in. I mean, like you could take a stand against things and it's still not enough. You know what I mean? And so some people you're never going to make happy. And that's just the way the, the cookie crumbles. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I, I, again, like when it's, um, you know, people also say, like, why don't you argue with people like that? Like, I don't know, anti-Semites or whatever. I'm like, I will argue, I'll argue with someone where we have a disagreement over facts, right? Like for instance, our disagreement even over taste, like you might like uh, Beethoven, I like Bach, right? Like, and we could just, we can argue about maybe who's more interesting, Beethoven or Bach. Like, oh, you're like, oh, I see. Like, you like Beethoven because he's more into romanticism and he's more emotional. And Bach, you like him because he's more technically interesting in terms of this. That's a debate between two people who can agree to disagree and see the merits in each other's argument. The difference between that and arguing with an anti Semite is they don't want me to exist. It's that I think all Bach people should be destroyed. Hmm. No, and notice that that's a very different kind of argument. There's no winning that argument, actually. There's not even having a conversation because the argument just is, right, I just don't want, I just don't want you to exist. It's because don't want... you rule the world, Dr. Sons. Oh, yeah, you yeah, yeah. It. That's why I'm on YouTube, on Patreon, and not using my uh, international Jewish conspiracy checks that I get every month. That's um, your, we know that's how you're funneling all your Illuminati income. Exactly. And, you know, it's... <laughs> seriously, though, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you one cool teaching from the um, Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. Is there one that really stands out to you that you're like, you know what, I really find interesting, and then we'll jump to Super Chats. Just something that you today go, that's one of my favorite things I find in the Kabbalah. Yeah, I mean, it's I, what's a really great teaching in, in the Kabbalah that I think is really beautiful. Um my, I learned this actually just recently and it's put very succinctly, but it's, it was put by my friend Zevi uh, from the channel Seekers of Unity, who's a, a dear friend of mine and, and, a, and a colleague. He's a great guy. Um, but he pointed to the idea that in, in the Kabbalah, and he's absolutely right about this, that uh, someone, someone other than me, someone other than me, their physical need is my spiritual need. Which is to say, if someone needs something like food or housing or shelter or whatever, then I need to, have, that has to become a spiritual need for me. I have to, that has to be something I need to fix. And so I like the idea that, um, that in a, in a, that in a very deep way, Kabbalah teaches that, um, that the, we're all connected, that the universe is all connected. The world's all connected in some fundamental way. And that, uh, that what we do in this world has ramifications well beyond us. Now, Zevi's doing a cool thing, by the way. He asked, uh, it's the largest philosophical collaboration in all of YouTube. He's going to all the major philosophy and religion channels and asking them, uh, does philosophy have meaning in the modern world? And they have two minutes to answer. <laughs> so he's just going through, uh, like, and it's just a really interesting kind of project. So you know, there are, like, huge channels on there. Uh, my little dinky channel is a bunch. So uh, it's a funny kind of um, 
kind of uh, kind of project. But I think that's a cool idea. For me, that you know, we tend to have the idea in America that we are like atomized individuals, right? The rugged individual, you know, like you know, home on the range. I'm by myself and I'm free. You know, as long as the government leaves me alone and people leave me alone, then I'm free. We think of freedom as sort of the the ability to do nothing. But the Kabbalah says that's not freedom and that's not liberty. We're all connected. Everything's connected from this world to the divine realm. And everything that you do has an impact on everything else. So one of the big ideas in Kabbalah is being very careful about what you do and what you say. Um, because it has ramifications that you can't control. And you are, you're responsible even for the ramifications that, that you couldn't control. Hmm. But you're spiritually responsible for those, for those things. And so um, most of us have heard of the, the idea of bystander, con uh, bystander effect. Right, you walk past a piece of trash on the ground because you expect someone else will pick it up, um, but there's a, a you know there's an idea that says uh, no. Like if you're the one seeing it, you're the one destined to pick it up. If you're the one seeing the need, you are the one ordained by God to fix it. Like the fact that you see it means that you're implicated in it. Hmm. And so it's a it's a teaching that I think is very powerful because it means that responsibility is a giant web, as opposed to like. You know, I'm just responsible for me as opposed to like, no, like you're part of this whole thing and you need to get on board fixing it. And so I really appreciate that idea come from, coming from Kabbalah. And I'm not a person who believes in mystical no, but stuff I see or whatever. practical implications from that that is so rich. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do live in this kind of, in America at least, the idea, I notice this in different traditions because my, my sisters married into Spanish or Mexican families. And so they're very tight knit. The grandmother and the parents, they all live in like the same house or the house next to the same house. Mm -hmm. They all are, as we would say, how our ancestors evolved together as units. And like my dad moved as far away as he could from his mom and dad with my with our family. My mom moved away as well. They became military, you know, military brats. We relocated, but we weren't connected like that. And I see the practical implication, whether you think the ontology is true there's something about even if you wanted to redefine god in the context and go you have to live with your own awareness of this do something because there is a reward to oneself in this and i find that is true so there's that aspect of religion that aspect of religion that i think we should always keep um we should have that we shouldn't move past these things so it, when I hear people speak um and they say hey i'm religious or i come from religion and they speak of these kind of practical implications that I see are very rewarding and necessary for us as humans. Um, I, I kind of inside go, amen. I may not attribute this to thinking there's really this like man upstairs with a checklist, or e even if it's not even that much, like I think there's some divine force that's involved. I myself, um, you know, have to live with myself. Mm -hmm. And so I have kind of reinterpreted some of these models of what we used in biblical or even like religious language. And I still see myself, my own consciousness as something that I need to answer for to myself, if that makes sense. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think that, yeah. I think that, that I don't think there's anything. Look, truth is truth. Um, Averroi says that truth cannot contradict the truth. And I think that if there is a truth to be found in religion, then I'm, it can be found in secular life too. Um, and, and to me, um, it speaks powerfully to me because it's just in my tradition. That doesn't make it any more or less true. The true is just the true, but it's a way of anchoring it in a language that, you know, comes from my ancestors and, you know, it's, it's, you know, the way that we talk, it's like, you know, so it's, so for me, um, you know, I don't think it, I don't think it has to be rooted in a religious language, right. religious discourse, religious ontology, because if it's true, it's true. That's just the way the truth functions. Um, just like, you know, people say, well, religion can justify all kinds of dreadful things. I'm like, yeah, it absolutely can. But so can secularism. I mean, right. Hitler right. and Stalin were perfectly secular and, uh, were more than happy to massacre millions of people. So I'm, for me, the question is not whether it's, you know, secular or religious. The question is whether it's true. And if it's true, then we can use the work of religion or philosophy to, to sort it out. But, um, I'm not, yeah, I don't want to be, cause again, I'm not a, supernatural believer in a God. I don't believe right, in right. anything like that. And so the question for me is like, what is not just what is true, but also what is meaningful and meaningful has as much to do with art and history and aesthetics as it does anything else. Yeah. And I found that that teaching is pretty beautiful the way that that's described and we don't have enough of that. Right. So people, that's a good thing to live by. 
Um, let's hit some of these supers, if that's cool with you. So feel free to super chat your questions in. Um, we are talking Kabbalah, but like mystical teachings, anything that you want to discuss, feel free to super chat the questions. All I ask is that we're respectful. And um, Dr. Sledge has been doing this for quite some time. Uh, I really appreciate everybody in the chat. So Sophia Hill says, thank you both so much. Both of you have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Sophia. I really appreciate the love and the support. Assyrian, uh, I'm going to butcher this. Is it Nahrin? Nahrin? Don't want to butcher the last name. But thank you for the super chat. Did you have a comment? Or qu oh, here we go. I am posting my question for Super Chat now for later to watch the show. I read that Kabbalah is taken from the sacred Assyrian tree of life. Is it any way connected to it? I don't think so. Um, so the, the tree of life uh, is a, the Eitz Chaim is a term. Actually, it's first used to describe the Torah. The, the, the Bible describes the Torah as an Eitz Chaim, a tree of life. Um, but um, the spherot, which I was talking about earlier, these are these nodes or emanations of the divine. When they're put into a very particular configuration where they're all perfectly balanced, which they never really are in, in Kabbalah, when they're perfectly balanced, we call that configuration the Eitzach, the Eitzachayim, the tree of life. Um, and so the idea is that we want to reconfigure those parts of God to be in balance because the Kabbalists believe that they're out of balance and that's what causes all the chaos in, in the world. And that God is actually in, God is actually out of balance at some level. Um, which is a very different vision of God than the Christian yeah. God, where God is sort of like all, all, all good and all powerful. And uh, Kabbalah, God is not good or all powerful. Um, God can be downright evil. And your, your task is to is actually to fix God um, as part of you interacting with the world. God is fixing the world and you're fixing God and it all meets in the middle. So wow. This is a very different conception of God um, as, a, as, as, a, as a being uh, in toto. But I doubt it because the, the safer, the Eitzachayim configuration of the Sefirot um, um, is an ideal state. And we don't really see it emerging until until a bit later. So I don't think they're related. Thank you so much, Assyrian. I appreciate you. But people Talk. love to put, uh, put lots of these things like Yggdrasil, like the, the Norse tree. Lots of mythologies have trees. Right. Just because lots of mythologies have trees and snakes doesn't mean that they have anything to do with one another. Right. Um, Daka says, besides sanitation, irrigation, the wine roads, public safety, and peace, <laughs> what have the Romans ever done for us? Jokes aside, love your work. <laughs> this sounds like more propaganda by the Judean People's Front. Uh, <laughs> no, it's the Judean uh, back the front, front of the People's Front of the yeah, Judean. You know. Yeah, I love that. So that's a great joke. Um, yeah, you know, it's there's a great, there's all great, interesting things to be read. Uh, you know, all jokes aside, but to, you know, looking into the history of how the rabbis related to the Romans. Um, you know, that the, if you read Josephus's, um, uh, the, the Jewish wars, you realize that the, one of the people he leaves out in many ways from the conversation of the rabbis, cause they wanted to have nothing to do with it. They were content to study and do their work and basically, you know, pay their taxes and keep their head down, which they thought was a pretty good deal. All things told. Um, but yeah, the, the civil war that was the, the great rebellion that the Romans took advantage of more than, you know, anything else, um, the rabbis wanted nothing to do with it. You know, for them, that was a, a battle between um, between various forms of extremism. And they prided themselves on on being moderates, you know. Um, and so, uh, yeah, again, when you when you see the vast majority of rabbis in the Talmud and other texts like Josephus, most of what they're trying to do is negotiate peace because they know that, you know, what do you want to kick the hornet's nest? Is that a good idea? Uh, and it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Definitely wasn't. Uh, I appreciate that uh, super chat. That's that's a funny one. Yep. Really appreciate it. Uh, Constellation Pegasus in the house. Thank you for the support, man. Good to see you here. Saying the names of angels will piss them off if you don't know Kabbalah. Good enough. And will make you insane. One rabbi says, there's a hospital in Israel to keep these people. I'd like to see that place investigated. I would too. <laughs> um. There's like the crazy and the religiously crazy. Um, it's a unique, a unique brand. Um, yeah, so there's a there is a tradition in Judaism um, that's coming out of this Merkava tradition where um, it sounds like a video game. It needs to be a video game where, in order to get to the the throne room of God, you have to pass through a bunch of antechambers, and these antechambers are guarded by angels. Now, I know that we typically think of angels as like two year olds with wings or something like that, but angels in the Jewish tradition are nothing like that. They're like 
they're more like Marines. Uh, they're like spiritual ber green berets. They're, they're very vicious, merciless fighters. Uh, they're soldiers. They're not, you know, they're not, uh, not babies. They're not there to coddle you. I mean, this is the reason why you read the Hebrew Bible. The first thing that angels say when they appear is be not afraid because they're real terrifying. But um, yeah, there are stories in the, there's lore, there are stories in the rabbinical literature and the mystical literature where people have gone into these, uh, these palaces unprepared. You typically need to know the secret names of the angels and you there's some gestures you have to do to, you know, get past like passwords. And um, there were cases in history um, in what Constellation Pegasus says, even now, where people practice these forms of mysticism and they go inside of these various divine chambers and um they're not they're they're where they shouldn't be and the angels just uh they can't kill them um but they can like decimate their minds and uh, the most famous case of this was a rabbi uh in the talmud named ben zoma uh, he went into one of these palaces and there's a and there's an illusion god sets traps for people it's like goonies god sets traps for people <laughs> in these palaces and one of the pal one of the traps is a, the water illusion and the water illusion looks like marble it's so pure water it looks like marble and if you think it's marble and you get confused and then God like kicks you out or the angels kick you out, they don't just kick you out. They like, they like destroy your mind. And um, Ben Zoma famously goes to the water illusion and says, um, um, it's, this is a wall of pure marble. We can't pass through it as opposed to realizing it's water. And he goes out, he's kicked out. And um, the text says that he remained outside for the rest of his life. And it's some euphemism for, like he could never speak again and he didn't, he wasn't interacting with the world properly anymore. Uh, and it said, uh, and from that day, Ben Zoma was outside and it's a really weird crypt. And we didn't hear nothing about him after that. Like he had some kind of complete mental breakdown. We think, um, this, so this we don't know, we don't know what happened, but it, there's lots of stories like that. I, I just to ask you, cause you've experimented just like I have, we've, we've definitely tried substances to, um, see things to experience things you name it um you've probably done them in religious settings my like i'm curious to know if you think that these men were dabbling with stuff that sent them into an alternative reality to a point where i don't know if you've met people who i would almost say kind of fried their brain um yeah, I've definitely met space cadets yeah and they yeah. come like they're they're not the same they, they they're, they're like you kind of know by walking around them how they once were and how they are now. It, it makes me wonder if, if these men were dabbling in some type of substance or. It's a good question. I mean, we do have some records of the breathing techniques and the physical postures that they, that they used. One of the, phys, one of the breathing techniques and physical postures was called the Jeremiah position. Uh, Jeremiah is famously famous for knowing the weeping prophet. He would place his head between his legs and he would weep hysterically. Apparently, they would do this. They would place their head between their, their like sitting, like sitting this, like sitting with your legs, your knees bent, mm -hmm. you would rock down and then cry hysterically, then breathe as you come back up and then go back down and cry, like cry hysterically. And you do this over and over rapidly. And there's some reason, some people believe that this was something like yoga maybe, and that the, these breathing techniques causes them to hyperventilate or deprive oxygen from their brain. And they would right. have these extreme visions or something. So that maybe that's a part of it. Right. Maybe they, they killed off so many brain cells or something. I don't know. Something, but we don't have, I mean, it, it seems like, you know, the place to go is maybe they were doing some kind of, some kind of pharma, like some kind of psychotropic drugs. We have very little evidence. Like we just found the cannabinoids on top of the Telerod shrine. So that tells us that the least of the always at the Telerod shrine were like hot boxing inside the Holy of Holies. Um, <laughs> Probably. I mean, it seems like there's at least evidence for that. I mean, we have I mean, to if I lived in the ancient world, I would have. <laughs> what a, you know, hey, you know, like if you want to see your God, you know, it's not going to hurt. Um, but we just don't have any evidence of it. We just don't have any. There's not like a smoking gun where it's like in this book, we have a secret part of the book where it says like, and you take these roots and combine them together and smoke them and you see the angels. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if, had, if, 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 if it said it, your point is, is like, we don't have it. That doesn't mean they weren't. It's just like. We, we don't need to like depend on that hypothesis to answer the question. Cause you're right. Hyperventilating and going into a trance could potentially give them the mystical experience they want. I mean, we go into them when we go to sleep, we have yeah. dreams. Yeah. So, so this, could be, this could be dreams. It could be, you know, we also know sleep deprivation was a part of it. Um, and so alcohol clearly was also part of it as well. Though alcohol is typically see, make you see that kind of stuff. So the, yeah, I mean, evidence of absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So, right. 
right? But, you know, people, there's two things we have to avoid in this literature. One of them is what I call like, um, there's a standard academic, um, what's the right word for it? Um, there's academic bias against uh, psychedelics. That's just there. We know that's there. Right, right. There's just an academic bi bi bias against it. But there's also what I call the other side of that, which is like DMT reductionism, uh, which is if anything is weird in religious literature, they must have been doing DMT. It's like the Joe Rogan hypothesis. Um, and so I think neither one of those, um, neither one of those work. And, you know, having experimented with DMT and mushrooms and LSD, um, they just don't give you the kind, they don't produce the kind of experience they're describing, which is a highly technical literary experience. And so maybe it's the case that there is some substance at work in all that. We don't have any evidence that there is. And it also doesn't explain the extraordinary detail. I'm, I'm doing an episode, not this week, but week, the week after on uh, the, the books of uh, Jew, uh, which is a Gnostic text produced in the fourth century that doesn't get any, any airtime. I don't know why. Uh, the Apocryphon of John and other books get all the airtime when it comes to Gnostic texts. But these are really important Gnostic texts. And they also have this ascent where you go through these various palaces and there are various angelic guardians and you have to use magic codes to get past them. So this was a this was a thing that was spread through the Eastern Europe, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean basin, uh, of course, of which there was a Jewish version and a Christian version, an agnostic version, pagan version, whatever pagan. Um, and um, and so this seems to have been spread ubiquitously. And also there, they just don't ever mention um, the kind of substances that we would think would be involved. Uh, and I'd say there weren't chemical yeah. compounds out there like that, but we don't have a lot of evidence for it. Thank you for answering that. Constellation, thank you for the support. Uh, Brent, Brentel, thank you for the super chat. Love your channel and your scholarship, Dr. Sledge. What started your interest and reverence in Kabbalah? Kabbalah and other esoteric traditions. Well, if you read the comments I had to uh, censor over on my Yahweh video, you would not believe I had any reference for anything um, <laughs> that I'm, uh, you know, um, that I'm destroying everything about religion by historicizing Yahweh. You know, everyone's fine with historicizing things until it's your God that gets historicized. Right. Um, right. You historicize, uh, you know, Allah or whatever and be like, yeah, there was, is, you know, is Arab polytheism before that. And the Christians are all fine with it. Muslims freak out. Uh, or, you know, that, uh, that Allah might be this and that. But yeah, um, uh, how to get into this stuff? I, I just grew up on like a pretty steady diet of like shows like um, Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World and uh, In Search Of with uh, like Leonard Nimoy and these like mystery shows, right? Like Unsolved Mysteries. There were all these shows about like, is the Bermuda Triangle real and is Loch Ness Monster real and are UFOs real? Um, you know, uh, and I, I used to like those shows as a kid. And I think what ends up happening to most people is I, you grow up and either you, you go off the deep end and begin believing all of it um, <laughs> and become a you know history channel watcher um, or you become a skeptic and you don't think about that stuff ever again. You're like, of course, Bigfoot's not real. It's stupid. Um, and to me, what ended up happening was I did both. I continued my interest and yet I became skeptical. Like, can I give an example to get your thoughts? Yeah. Sure, Bigfoot isn't real. I don't think that Bigfoot is real. However, I'm more interested. I'm, I'm the weirdo who says, why is this phenomenon taking place? And and what did they see um, that, that made them think this was Bigfoot? Or are some of these accounts completely made up? Maybe they mistook a bear and thought it was Bigfoot or whatever. And like, I'm interested in solving the riddles because I think they can be, or at least if they're unsolvable, then we put them in a category, but people believing based on that kind of stuff, it, it interests me. That yeah. the whole phenomenon interests me. Yeah, the yeah, what why people believe anything at all is fascinating, especially believing relatively unusual things. Like, I mean, I remember doing the math when I was a kid um, uh, about uh, the Bermuda Triangle. I was like, what's a good way of thinking about whether or not Bermuda Triangle is real? Well, a really great way of thinking about it is, does it cost any more to insure boats going through the Bermuda Triangle? So for instance, if I'm, if I have a big boat and I'm putting a bunch of cargo through the Bermuda Triangle, which is a very popular shipping lane, does it, does it, do I have to pay Lloyd's of London any more money to insure it? And the answer is no, I don't. And I was like, well, if I, if an insurance company won't take advantage of that to rip you off then it must not be real. And so it was like, you know, or like, um, uh, uh, or like how, so let's say that there is a creature roughly that size in Loch Ness. 
how much food does it have to eat to stay alive? And how many Loch Ness monsters must there be in the lock to continue to generate more children? And you just do some math. You realize, like, there has to be like 20 Loch Ness monsters in there. And that's too, the, the lock's not big enough. And the lock is actually notoriously uh, oxygen poor and or whatever. It doesn't have enough food in it to support a big creature like that. So, yeah, I, the same way for me. I'm, I'm interested in these questions, but I'm interested in covering them from an academic, scholastic, evidence-based point of view. And it's not to say there's anything inherently impossible about there being a Bigfoot. It's possible. Yeah. The question is, like, what's going on there? And so when it comes to Kabbalah and stuff like that, you know, uh, um, basically I, I decided that I wanted to study this unusual part of our tradition, right? Our, our unusual part of, uh, I see our tradition, I'm speaking of the Western world. When I think about magic, Kabbalah, alchemy, uh, you know, the occult or whatever. And it just turns out that there's not a lot of places that you can do that study academically. And I was like, I want to do it because I, because it's interesting to me. And so I went and, and, and studied it in the University of Amsterdam and did it. So um, everybody niches down in academia. That's what you do. You niche down, right? Like you, uh, you go from a general bachelor's to now you're major in religion. Now you specialize in early Christianity or second temple of Judaism. My specialty just happens to be uh, Western esotericism. So I definitely, I, I appreciate you too. And like, uh, I think that uh, some people who are believers of some sort, whether they are Christian, whether they are esoteric in their beliefs, they're Gnostic, whatever, you could tell they get offended by my, what I do. Like, like I am somehow damaging or tampering with their traditions because I do have a lot of my stuff is rhetorically aimed at dismantling fundamentalist and apologetic works. However, that's what also interests people to even take notice in the teachings that we find within Gnostic circles and such. So, so we all play a part um, in what we're doing. And I'm personally interested in learning all of this stuff, knowing what the Gnostics taught, what they think, the weird, interesting things they thought about God or whatever. I don't believe it. Yeah. And for some that offends, that makes them not, uh, not want to hear me out. Or they think I don't like, because I don't believe it, I'm abusing and I have no clue what I'm talking about. It's like, well, do you, do you believe it, Dr. Sledge? But you know what you're talking about here. So I don't see why we're not, you know, encouraging that more, even if we don't agree at the end of the day on certain things. Yeah. There, there seems to be a weird, a weird thing that happens uniquely in the world of religious studies where, there's the idea that you can't really understand something unless you believe it, you know, in the same way that like, you know, if I were, I don't know, if I were a studier of, of Norse mythology, it, I don't think it wouldn't be terribly surprising that, I, you know, if I didn't believe in Thor, I guess, like, you right. know, um, but there's an expectation in this field for whatever reason that like, unless you're a real as a terrorist, you don't know what you're talking about. So that's the one crit critique I get like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about because you're not really a practitioner of this stuff. Um, the other critique I get, weirdly enough, is that I'm exposing all the secrets and therefore all of the all of the the gurus and stuff are angry at me because I'm like, you know, exposing their secrets. I'm like, they're not that secret, man. Like, I'm just like looking at Google Scholars and like archive.org to look at these old books and I'm just telling you what's in them. I'm telling yeah, you anyone the could read, if you can read it, you can find out what they say. Like, yeah. I'm like, if your secrets are being put out there, it's not my fault. Like, Yeah. So. Thank you for that. I just want to make that comment, man. Philip A. Demick says, someday, comment on Oak Island, Nolan's Cross. What's TOL? I don't know. I mean, there's nothing on Oak Island. I mean, they like plowed that entire island to the bedrock in the 60s or whatever. The, there's nothing there. Like, it's just, it's great TV. I mean, it's yeah. really fun for the Lagina brothers, like, to go out there and basically be like, kids spend a whole bunch of the history channel's money like you know sinking boars or whatever but um no like there's no there's no treasure on oak island i don't i i uh, I, I would love to uh i'd love for there to be a treasure on oak island but um the templars were all massacred that didn't yeah none of that stuff it's it's good tv but it's bad history yeah the, the ironically named channel um like, but yeah, I, uh, uh, yeah, I would love for there to be some kind of treasure on that island just because I'm a goonie at heart too. But, um, yeah, that, what is it? The, whatever the Atlas company or whatever, that's like plowed that island to the 
bone uh, in the 60s and they found I it. would watch that on what was it like discovery or history or something I was watching them and I was thinking they're going to eventually find like a thing right and you know like it, it, every time the machine almost kills a man they dive down into the well and then they, they almost don't make it out alive they found a chamber down there like and it's always like they come back with nothing. It always tries to leave you hanging at the end for the next episode. Or like the, the rhetorical, like, could it be yeah. that the Templars <laughs> escaped from the Inquisition and landed in Milwaukee? I'm like, anything could be. Yeah. Like that. It's not, there's nothing logically prohibitive about that. Um, the question is what do we, what do we actually have evidence for? And um, again, if we're going to study the, I don't know, the Templars, we should study the Templars and then understand like why they were prosecuted and, what happened to them? And if some of them did survive, what, what happened to them or whatever? Right. But um, again, what makes for great TV is one thing. And trust me, I like good, I like good trash TV too. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, whether it's ancient astronauts or UFOs or Oak Island stuff, I think again, um, that's, uh, that's entertainment, not, they should have to put a disclaimer in front of a lot of that stuff actually. Just be like, this is in the same way that like you go to a casino and it's like, this is for in your entertainment, not uh, you can't really uh, trust it. This is a scheme. It's a you know way to make ad revenue. Yeah. Like they warn you on cigarette packs. Um, Pen Penagiotis, forgive me if I butchered this. I've really been enjoying your Zohar streams. Wondering if you consider doing something similar on Archaim of Volazin's Nefesh Hachaim. I don't know if I'm saying that Chaim. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this is a uh, so uh, Rabbi Chaim of Volzhen was a pretty famous Hasidic master, and he has a pretty famous book called Nefesh Chaim, uh, the Soul of Life, the no, Life of the Soul. Um, probably not one because I have a uh, complete bias against Hasidut because I'm irrational and mean. Um, Hasid Hasidism was a form of Jewish revivalism. Uh, kind of think about like Jewish Pentecostalism that sort of took hold in the 18th century. I, I come from a more Lit Lithuanian background and they were fiercely opposed to it. In fact, they called themselves the Mitnagdim, the opponents, <laughs> those who lock horns with them. Um, probably not just because I'm not that I don't have that much background in, in Hasidut. And um, I just find like, at least from my content, I want to go back to as far back into the original sources as possible and deal with as primary sources as possible, as opposed to like, you know, uh, you know, Zohar's being written in the late 13th century, you know, these are much later, you know, 500 years later old texts that are relying on much older traditions. And I feel like, um, and I'm sure this is the same thing you have to deal with, Derek, that um, that religious literacy is so abysmally low in the in this world that you really have to do a really firm foundational work to like be like, okay, let's get at what the New Testament actually is. What does it say? Um, because if you try to jump four centuries later to Augustine and you don't yeah. really see what the polemics and what the, the lay of the land looks like, uh, before that, it, it, it's really, really difficult to, to have a, an intellect and have, have an intellectually responsible, intellectually rich conversation without having a really firm foundation. And, you know, to, to your point on the super chat, most people to have a conversation with Hasidut, we would need to have a really firm foundation in. Uh, not just Zohar, but also Lurian at Kabbalah and its uptake uh, post Shabbatite V, and then the rise of the Hasidic movement, the Baal Shem Tov and, and those guys. So it's like asking, could we do the same thing about a text that people are even less prepared to, to deal with? It's, it's, a, it's a difficult um, process to go through because, you know, I, I'm actually going to be interviewing. Let me list off some names here coming up this week. Um, just to tease everybody. So I got you today. Dr. Jennifer Glancy is coming on tomorrow. For those who don't know, she wrote about slavery in New Testament time with Jesus and stuff. Um, Del Martin, right? He's coming on Wednesday. And I haven't interviewed Del for a long time. I was in contact with him a while ago, but I got, I got kind of, I guess, discouraged. We had a conversation on the phone one night and it was like, I don't know, it was East Coast, probably like 9 30, 10 o'clock. I was shocked. He emailed me back and gave me his number and stuff. And I was like, all right, I gave him a call. We talked. And he was like, I was, what do you want to cover? And I, this was my words. So you can get where I'm coming from and get where he's coming from. I said, I want to know what Paul meant. I want to deal with Paul. What did Paul, what was Paul trying to do? What did he mean when he wrote some of these letters and stuff like that? And 
he answered with this thing like, stop trying. Stop trying to know what Paul meant. Stop trying to figure out what he said. Like, what he said, Do you care why Beethoven wrote his first symphony? symphony? And I'm like, no. Uh, he goes, it doesn't matter. It matters how Beethoven is understood or ha- how his first symphony is understood today because it's art. This is how he was putting it. I couldn't disagree with him more on this. Like, I'm not saying people don't make their own, like we're talking about Kabbalah and like esotericism and the meaning and meta narrative as Jordan Peterson does. And I have like such criticism of kill all men, women, and children of the Amalekites. I imagine Jordan Peterson would read this and probably go inside each one of us. There's, there's a man or a child. child. Yeah. Like inner struggle of the, and it's like, Oh, the historical context, please. Well, we got in a back and forth on that for a while on the phone and i just was like i it turned me off but then i did some more research and stuff and i want to talk about the single savior sex and the single savior book that he wrote uh particularly dealing with jesus and uh we're gonna talk about that wednesday that being said i'm getting what you're saying like you need to have a foundation because if you take augustine and you interpret paul that way you're you're probably gonna miss paul right you're gonna miss paul because you're reading augustine because Augustine believes that Paul wrote everything that is ascribed to him, and he didn't. Things like that. Yeah, and there's yeah. also historical context that sways his interpretation of Pauline material. And how do we get behind that? How do we see the wizard behind the the curtain here, uh, which is Paul? If we're reading through Augustine's specific particular biases he's dealing with, or his own historical context centuries after Paul. So I'm. I, that's a. This is a tough one. Yeah, it's it's always hard because you never well, you also don't want it to be like, oh, we're just going to spin our wheels and do history and never get to later stuff. Like, yeah, it, obviously the history, it, it does matter because if no one ever read Paul and if, you know, I would say that in some ways, Augustine had more of an impact than Paul did because of he basically pioneered Western Christianity as we know it. Um, so clearly he's important. But um, but yeah, I feel like for me, just as in my methodology, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a historical materialist. I'm a, a, a historicize. And so when I, when I get into these texts, what is interesting to me, what's interesting to me is what, what are the historical and social, cultural, economic uh, conditions that produce them? And it's only when I have a grasp or at least a handle on that, that I can, I can begin to have a, an appreciation for how they get taken up into the, the broader scope of, of history. So, yeah, like, you know, and it's also like, I, and people find this sometimes unrewarding, uh, what I do on my channel and they're like, well, I just listened to a 40 minute video on Yahweh. What does this mean for my monotheism? I'm like, I can't tell you that. I'm not a I'm not I'm not here to do theology. Like that's a theology. I believe what you said, Dr. Sledge, but how do you fix this problem I now have? <laughs> what does it mean? And I'm like, I don't know what it means. I, I, I you know, because that's a that's a philosophical question, and my my channel's not a philosophical channel. I can tell you what it means for me. Right. But that's not what it means. Um, and so I think that again, it's, it's a, it's often people who are raised in a religious environment where meaning is ultimately what matters and not history. And therefore when you do the history and it doesn't line up with what it's supposed to line up with, according to their beliefs, and they're, they're left with this cognitive dissonance. And that's a healthy place to be. If you, if you experience a cognitive dissonance, sit with that. Well, I, I want to defend myself here for just a second and say what you just said is important to what I do. My, I know I deal with a lot of apologists and, and I know that there's a constant rhetoric that comes from my channel. My ultimate goal in this historical research with many people who are like me is to show as example, and I'm saying it, that I have meaning. Like you have meaning, I have meaning. We find our meaning somehow with whatever it is in our life and the things we do within ourselves and, and with others around us that give us those meaning and purpose. I try to combat this, this notion that you can't have meaning unless you have this foundational principle, you know, metaphysical, if you don't know, if you don't have a absolute morality, for example, or whatever, like I'm trying to show like, no, you have meaning. I have meaning. Even if you found out historically, Yahweh was just another ancient near Eastern deity who, you know, was evolved over time. And you're somehow going, Oh my gosh, this is popping my bubble. I don't think I can literally believe this anymore. Well, we have meaning. You don't need to have that in order to have meaning. 
I'm trying to give people options is the goal. So anyway, thank you for listening to my Ted talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, yeah, I think any, yeah, any, any, any meaning that's, that can be historicized away was probably not a very good meaning to begin with. Right. I mean, that's why you said in your video on Yahweh at first, you're like, look, like I'm just doing historical work here, like fair warning. But if, if finding out a fact, like a historical fact, like pops your bubble, you might yeah. want to align yourself more with historical facts and find meaning there, you know? Yeah. And same with Kabbalah, you know, when people find out that the Kabbalah is a 13th century um, invention and it doesn't go back to the Torah uh, or back to the Sinai or when they find out that Sinai wasn't in the Sinai, it was probably in Mount Seir or, you know, or whatever. Um, this can be a real blow to people's uh, belief systems. But, uh, you know, for me, I'm like, I can't change the fact there are medieval Spanish words in this book. Like, I don't get to make the facts. <laughs> Thank God. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to have that responsibility. But all I can do is say, this is what we know. And what we know will change. We will learn new things. And what I'm saying now will be, you know, will be, have to be undergo its own critique. But at the end of the day, um, for me, what being open and being willing to receive the criticism and adjust one's worldview accordingly, it's just not all. I mean, aside from burying your head in the sand, there's not a lot of uh, a lot of other respectable options. Thank you, Nadav. Thank you, Kravitz. Just uh, Justin Sledge. Could you do a video on Volkish esotericism in the Third Reich or esoteric anti-Semitism more generally? Yeah, I mean, are you trying to avoid the 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 people that come in from this kind of stuff? Or oh no, I don't care about that. I'll just block those people. It doesn't really matter. Um, um. The short answer is, the short answer is maybe, probably no. And the reason is not because I, I'm, I shy away from as you know, Volkish esotericism or uh, Nazi esotericism or whatever. The, the the real the main answer that I why I would shy away from it has more to do with the fact that I just don't have any expertise in that. Okay. I just don't. I don't work in the 20th century. You'll notice that almost all of the content on my channel skews to about uh, pre 1850. I kind of do sorties out from there. I'll maybe do a little touch and grab. But even if I cover something like Alistair Crowley, I'm only covering him because he has a connection back to pre-modern times in a way that I can I can tell a responsible story given my expertise. So, you know, Nicholas Gover Kark and other folks have written some pretty great stuff about uh, about uh, uh, Nazi occultism and stuff like that. I, in so the, one, I just don't have the expertise. Two, I think it gets overplayed. I, I think that when we look at the totality of the Third Reich and you look at the inner circle around Himmler, really, in the SS Annenerbe, it looks like a tiny group of people. But it, 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 there's a way of making it out to be like the, the SS or, or the Nazi movement, really the SS, was sort of mystically inclined. And Hitler certainly wasn't. Um, I think he couldn't give a damn about whatever those weirdos were doing up in that castle or whatever. But we 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 have this Kaffel Wolfenstein version of Nazism, right? Where they're all like it's like a mystical new world order, and I think that that represented a very tiny clique within you know the Rune Society and its uptake into uh, maybe a little bit of the SS Annenerba and and maybe the clique right around uh, Himmler, but I think it was a really tiny minority of people, mm -hmm. um, and I think it didn't have any sort of long, aside from some runes on their uh, you know uniforms or whatever i don't think it had a huge impact on the overall ideology of the ss uh, or the overall ideology of, of the nazi movement which is heterogeneous i mean people forget that um you know you had as a you know hitler fanatics and then you also had just like rank and file of uh, soldiers who couldn't give a shit about uh aryan yeah. purity or, or whatever so again i, I um i think i just don't want to there's a part of me that's just like yeah, it was there, but I don't think it was that big. Again, it's the history channelification of this stuff. It makes for good sensationalism, yeah. but I just don't know that it would be that. I don't have the expertise, and also I don't think it's that. It's um, it's um, it's it was all that central to the to the ideology. I mean, I think corporatism within the Nazi movement scared me a lot more than um, an SS mysticism around Himmler. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What it, like an interesting topic that I think of wanting to know more about is just how they came to create their own little Aryan mythology and like how it, it circles itself around the folk and the people in this region and the, like the land, all of that. It interests me to learn. It's also one of those super sensitive areas where it's like, dude, 
this is look at how bad people's beliefs in this weird mythology really cause such propaganda against Jewish people. It's it's wild. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating. I mean, like I said, the SS Anunerba is incredibly interesting. I mean, that's a, basically a, a wing of the SS that was sent out throughout the world, they went to Tibet and all kinds of places, basically to try to find evidence of this uh, Aryan theory, which the Nazis didn't invent; they they inherited it. It was developed outside of them, and a section, mm -hmm. a clique of the Nazis uh, uh, developed it. And um, but yeah, the the SS Anunerba is sort of um, the 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 real interesting wing of all that. Um, yeah. anytime the military and the archaeological wing of a country are combined, be worried. <laughs> no joke. Thank you. Jerry, uh, Hogwade, Hogwade. Thank Very you nice for the super question. chat. I make it sure I didn't leave you hanging here. Oh, there you are. I've seen astrology <laughs> incorporated in Kabbalah. If true, do they use zodiacs or constellations? Yeah. I mean, so there, there is both Kabbalistic and non-Kabbalistic astrology. Um, uh, astrology has a long, complicated history in, in Judaism, just like it does in Christianity and Islam. Um, uh, it's never, it's never totally kosher, and it's never totally forbidden. Um, the 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 Jewish tradition, which I will speak for, particularly has a split mind about uh, what to do with uh, uh, astrology. Um, and on and one hand, right? Um, on the one hand, there's a famous saying. In the in the Talmud, right? Ain um, uh, Israel. There's no Mazal on, on Israel. There's no there's no astrological forces on Israel. Therefore, astrology doesn't apply to Israel. Therefore, astrology in general is bunk, and we shouldn't do it. Um, and the other position is no. God made the universe to work a certain kind of way, and the stars are a way that God communicates. You know, the, like uh, like the weather, right? You look at the the way the winds change, and you go like, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow. Well, you look at the stars, and you're like, well, it's going to be a pestilence tomorrow, and so. You, you basically, God is telling you what's about to happen so you can prepare yourself. And so if you're wise, you can look up there and figure it out. And they're just like, no, it's just one more way of telling the weather. It's just the astrological weather. Um, and so Judaism has always had a split mind about what to do with astrology. And um, that's true with whether it's Kabbalistic astrology or normie Jewish astrology. But, you know, the biggest Bible commentator of the of the, what, 13th century, uh, Ibn Ezra, also wrote huge books about how to do astrology. So again, because back then it was a science. It was taught in the universities. It, you right. know, it wasn't it wasn't uh, esoteric back then, actually, which is weird, uh, considering how we think of it now. But um, yeah, Judaism has always had an interesting relation. You got, um, Derek, did you go to the Beit Alpha Synagogue when you were in Israel? I think so. That the, sounds familiar. With the big uh, the big uh, zodiac in the middle. Of the multiple floor. ones. We went. Yeah. To, I went to multiple ones with the zodiac on the floor. Yeah, one yeah. had. One you could see had the sun god in the middle. The other one was defaced, but one of them wasn't defaced. Yeah. And from Greek and Hebrew uh, inscriptions, both Gentiles you could see, or at least Hellenized Jews that were yeah. there. Yeah. So again, that's like, you know, if you want a classic example, we have the Talmud saying it's bunk and nonsense and no one should do it. And we have it on the floor of synagogues <laughs> in the Galilee. So that tells you multiple. Yeah. So it tells you that it was a, it was always a complicated issue. And, um, so it, it would depend largely on who you asked about whether they were doing astrology and whether they thought it worked or not. Those are really great things to go look at in person too, if you ever go. Brave New History, Elliot in the house. Elliot, appreciate you here, man. Thoughts on Abraxas? Why a rooster man snake? I have no idea. No one knows. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sorry. I just like, you know, this when we get into the early days of Gnosticism, you know, like sort of what does this imagery represent? Where does it come from? Uh, why they're an evil demiurge? Like, there's a lot of speculation, but we just don't have a smoking gun. Um, it seems like there were some heterodox Jews, you know, sometime first century BCE ish, first century CE, that were that came to the conclusion that the God that they had learned about in the Hebrew Bible was evil. For you know, it's not a weird conclusion to come to if you just look around. The world's pretty crappy. Um, and so, but why that image of the the rooster man snake? Because um, there's also sometimes also a lion in there. Um, I mean, there's something about monstrosity, obviously. Like there's something about this this entity of Abraxas, Yadabaoth, right? Probably Yadabaoth is coming from Hebrew Aramaic, like has something to do with chaos. And so the idea that you'd get a, a, a deity that's sort of a mixed up version of a monstrous version of um, of of 
of a thing where it's con it's it's an inherently confused it's, it's nature is confused makes speaks to the fact that this this creature is somehow you know having to do with chaos somehow hmm. um but again speculation i'm just speculating i, I don't right. know and and, there, and we don't have a smoking there's no text in nagamati that says oh and if you're wondering the rooster this is, means this and the snake yeah that means this yeah. and and you know people spin it that the the snake is of is orphic stuff orphic stuff that the you know the you know there's a part in the talmud where it says that uh, demons have legs like roosters uh, you know snakes obviously have a long history and and you know and and lots of religions about being you know uh, uh malevolent and also like heal healing uh think of the brass serpent and and the and moses but the truth of the matter is i don't think anyone knows um Nice Elliot, you thank you, man. And look, keep fighting the fight. Just rise above and keep doing what you do, brother. Uh, Brentley, we're almost done here, Doctor Sledge. I just and we got to give a plug to you because we're running out of time. We only got like four or five minutes. I don't want to go past ninety minutes. Given your knowledge of everything esoteric, can you speculate the origins of Kabbalah, like Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, Mother Mary, Islamic mysticism? Yeah, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, pretty clearly Neoplatonism is playing a role in that, right? We know that there are active Jewish Neoplatonists like Ibn Gabi Roll, who are a big part of it. I, I think less Gnosticism. I, I know that Gershon Scholem and, and those folks in the early 20th century really linked the idea that there was some of a, Gnostic, a, a survival, some Gnostic ideas. Uh, you know, again, whatever Gnostic is, Gnostic is a really difficult category that should, should be used with a, a lot of caution. Um, but we know that 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 some Jews were already independently developing a kind of neo dualism, uh, and dualism dualism was kind of in the air. There seemed to have been Christian dualists, folks that we now call the Cathars, uh, were also operating in that in that region in southern France and northern uh, in northern uh, Spain. Um, you mentioned Mother Mary. The that's another important part of all of it, right? The rise of the Marian cult in Spain in the 13th century. Um, that's also going to be part of the polemics that go on inside the Zohar in terms of the importance of God's female, the feminine, imminent part of God, the Shekhinah. Uh, and so they're clearly polemicizing against the Christians and sort of anything you can do, I can do better with the the Marian cult and the rise of Shekhinah. Um, Islamic mysticism isn't going to play a big role in the very beginning of, of, the, of the Kabbalah, but it will play a big role later especially in the dissemination of Kabbalah as it, as it sort of rubs up against Sufi circles uh, over in the Ottoman Empire and it have, have a huge impact on Shabbatianism and, and stuff like that. So absolutely, there's there are all of those things at some level are part of the part of the um, um, they're part of how the sausage got made to mix my metaphors. But um, but again, I'll give an example of this. We've looked and looked and looked and looked and looked for any connection, you know, uh, for instance, if we could find the word ab ab Abraxas, or if we could find Sophia, or Yaldabaoth, or Samia, or, or Saklas, or something like that, Samia is actually in there. Um, but if we could find part of the apocryphon of John, you know, uh, Barbella mythology, it, if we could find some of that stuff in some of these early Kabbalistic texts, we'd have a smoking gun. We just don't. It seems like they come to these conclusions independently. Um, and if you get into the weeds of it, uh, yeah, they're all kind of imminent, emanatory systems where there's some kind of cosmic tragedy. Well, you don't really need to borrow something to make that happen because you have to explain how you get from an infinite God to a finite world. And emanation is one way of doing it. And you have to also explain why the world sucks. And to do that, you need some kind of fall, some tragedy, some metaphysical mistake. And so insofar as they're dealing with the same fundamental logic in the same fundamental world, you don't have to really think, oh, well, secret Gnostic teachings survived all the way and they were imported into Spain and they did this and that and the other. You can simply say, well, no, there were people trying to figure out how the way the world worked and they probably came to very similar conclusions independently of one another. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would say I would say that. It's just, that's where the evidence seems to be um, increasingly pointing us to. Last one, last second here. Last second, Gravy J says, in what way does Zionism relate to Kabbalah? Uh, I mean, Zionism is a secular movement. Uh, it has a religious component now that's been growing since the 1960s, really. Um, and there are definitely um, religious Jews oh who are deeply opposed. Um, it's okay. I, I can stay until 145. Um, yeah. I, um, yeah the, so the, the short answer is that if you're looking at really Orthodox Jews who are really into Kabbalah, they're going to be anti-Zionists. 
Um, but there are also Zionists uh, who are interested in Kabbalah, who are, or, or, who are interested in it and who believe that the state of Israel is part of the grand, you know, apocalyptic eschatology and it's all part of the plan or whatever, the, the redeeming the Messiah. So um, Zionism is a secular movement and how it gets, how it got taken up into the religious movement. It's a very complicated story, but in general, um, I mean, most historical religious Jews were opposed to Zionism until basically the late sixties. Hmm. Thank you. And by the way, the largest group of Hasidic Jews, Satmars, are still opposed to it. Um, uh, I know I've heard Orthodox Jews say things like um, um, raising the Israeli flag is the equivalent of burning a Torah. Um, like, because they hate the state of Israel, because they think it's an apostate state. Right. They're like, only the Messiah can make the Israel. Anything other is, 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 uh, is, uh, is apostasy. Uh, Apricorsine. Wow. Thank you for that. Sorry, these key. Look, last two. <laughs> uh, Dr. Romanat, how do we differentiate mainstreams of Gnostic, Pythagorean thought as older schools merged into eclectics? So many shadowy figures like the Ammonius, Sacchus, uh, or Pantanius? Yeah. Like, so Ammonius Sacchus was famously the teacher of Plotinus and Panatius, I think is who you're referring to, who was the teacher of Posidonius. He was one of the uh, scholars. By the way, Pan Panatius actually rejected astrology, one of the few Stoics that did. Um, I don't know they were ever mainstream, to be honest with you. I think they're always fringe movements. Um, and the way that I, I think that is basically like how many survive, you know, how many manuscripts of those kinds of folks survive into history, you know, two manuscripts of the Apocrypha of John versus dozens and dozens of other texts. So I think they were always relatively not mainstream. Um, and I think that also the way we think of schools is probably, probably not accurate. I think that we think of like, um, I don't, I'm on team this and you're on team that. I think that it was a lot more, I might go to listen to Ammonius Sacchus one day and I might go listen to Valentinus the other day and I might go and there, you know, you'd have some hardcore members and you have a lot of people floating around. And I think that it was a, it was a, a pretty amorphous world where these kind kinds of a of buffet ideas, in a way, I think it was a, 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 yeah, a bit of a buffet. And I think that there were lots of movements in between these things and, and some of them were initiatory. And I think the fact that they were initiatory is actually an acknowledgement of the fact that they were trying to get people to stick with them. Um, that tells me that they didn't want that. They wanted you to be like, no, pick us. You got to be Valentinian or whatever. Maybe he's a bad example, actually, because I think that he, the borders of that movement were very, very porous, in fact. Because um, I don't think he ever called himself Valentinianism. He was right. just Christian. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think they're, you know, Ammonius Sacchus and Panatius definitely aren't shadowy figures. They're, they were heads of schools. I mean, Ammonius Sacchus taught Plotinus and Panatius was the lead scholar of, uh, the Stoic, a uh, Stoic uh, uh, school in, uh, I think, Alexandria. But um, I think eclecticism was the rule and dogmatism was the exception. Um, and, you know, Christianity uniquely, I think, became dogmatic. And, you know, I think it was that the early, the early, uh, so proto-Orthodoxy, its dogmatism, I think, was really unusual. Hmm. Doc, uh, thanks for that support and and popping in last minute. Aaron Miller, thank you both so much for all your dedication to making scholarship digestible to us mere mortals. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. You know, uh, I'm for me. What's the purpose of knowing all this stuff if you can't make it accessible? You know, we, you know, whether it's just like making it accessible at the level of having conversations or making it accessible as part of like the project democracy. I really think that education what separates democracy from mob rules education right mm -hmm. like a mob rule they're both just a bunch of people deciding to do stuff but what makes democracy democracy is that we're all thinking before we act and an educated population especially on religion where religion is playing such a huge role in america american politics and world politics um the question for me is always like do i want to live in a better society and if i do i need to be contributing what i can and what i can contribute is this weird little chunk of knowledge i have and more educated people, better critical thinking people, um, whether you're religious or not or whatever, we live in a better world where people are thinking harder, thinking deeper. And, you know, and if I can contribute to that, then, then I, I will have, you know, left the world a eensy beensy bit better than I, than I found it. And you now I'll, I'll die happy. That's such you, 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 that is exactly what I was saying two weeks ago, having conversation with family members about what, I mean, I hypothesize that, you know, the way it used to be is this knowledge needs to be kept away. They had this idea about knowledge having 
power and if it gets into the wrong hands, right? Like what is going to happen? So we need to keep all of this deep teaching and wisdom hidden from the, the common folk. Uh, this idea, a lot of people have, I don't know if that's ubiquitous, but it, it, in my mind, it's like if everyone knew this historical research and understood all of the material we're talking about, it would make such an impact on the world. Um, it, it would change so much. So at first, my whole inquiry in the myth vision was purely like just a knowledge thing. Let's just learn. Over time, I realized how practical, how applicable this is to society and how it can really change the world in a better way. So I love what you said there, Dr. Sledge. I mean, you're doing it. You're doing it. And I'm trying to do it as well. No, you're certainly you're certainly part of it, man. You're like, again, this whole little sphere of, of you know, religion YouTube, I think is really you know, making stuff that uh, no one should have to go into massive amounts of debt and move halfway across the country to take a class or learn about the Jesus movement or esotericism or anything else. Uh, we have a platform. We have the ability to make it free and we can crowdsource the the cost that it takes us to do it. And it does cost us. And, you know, it, it allows us to do all this kind of, it allows us to do all of this without, uh, yeah, without uh, sinking our ship. And again, making this stuff accessible, it's just, it's just it's well worth it and people deserve to have access to it and they should not have to go into crippling debt um and some prestigious yale that they can't get into because they're not born in with a silver spoon in their mouth um yeah. they should have access everyone should have access to material look i'm doing this on air i want to one day if you're available i'd love to do a course with you dr sledge and yeah. make your you make obviously it would be beneficial to helping you but it makes your education accessible and stuff you already do it on your channel but it might be cool to have like a classroom setting type thing one day so maybe you and me can talk yeah let's talk i'm i'm, I'm, I'm uh, take yeah i'm all always listening always uh interested in well, what we can do to again to amplify each other's voices and i'm always glad to be to be on your channel derek you do fine work and i really appreciate the work that you do so thank you hey I, the least I can do is mention you have your YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Let's do, there's no reason you're not at a million subs. We need to grow the community by doing so. You can like his videos. You can share his videos to your audience. Everybody plays a significant role in growing these platforms, especially I was talking to Dr. Justin Sledge this morning. You know, he's untangling some of the most mysterious text on planet Earth. And yet we're talking about this algorithm that we don't even know how to crack on YouTube. We're just somehow it's working for us in some ways. You better than me at the moment. <laughs> but uh, it's like, you know, help us. We think this will help. Share it out there. Get this material out there. Go support him by subscribing. Go check out his website. Go support him on Patreon. You can do the same for here at Myth Vision. All of these are ways you can contribute to helping change the world, as we said at the end, and uh, educating more people to to think critically, to to, and not not just bash, like value the historical information. Don't judge the ancients. Learn from them. Like. Mm -hmm. Like know what's right and wrong and do these kind of things. So any words from you about your Patreon? Maybe you have something coming up. Yeah, I guess the big thing coming up, uh, just that, you know, I'm doing a uh, like a celebration of, you know, the some of the milestones of the channel this, this uh, Thursday or Friday. I haven't decided yet. But um, yeah, it's like, you know, every week I try to put out uh, new content, whether, you know, and every week it's some live streams, it's some uh, original content, it's Q and A's. I really try to keep the, the door at, at Esoterica open you know, at least a couple times a week, just so that people can plug in and and you know pick up something. So, um, but yeah, what are, is anything big plan coming up? Um, we had really we had good success with the with the Zohar with me and Zevi. Uh, Philip over at Let's Talk Religion has uh, agreed to do something similar with Meister Eckhart. So, if you're interested in Christian mysticism, uh, we'll be looking at uh, a pretty famous text by by Meister Eckhart at some point in the future. I'm not sure when we'll kick it off, but um, um, you know, I, 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 I enjoy all these texts and I love studying them and, um, uh, be great to, to do that. But yeah, you know, what you said about the ancients, just don't, uh, you know, let's don't cancel the ancients, um, let's study them. And, um, yeah, Philip also has a great channel, but, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, with you, Derek. Um, uh, we, we don't have the, we don't have the luxury, luxury of canceling history, uh, cause it's there whether we like it or not. And if we don't learn from it, we will repeat it. Absolutely. And I, I seriously value and appreciate what you've done by coming here and joining me at Nubis Fire. Thank you. Great job. Love the work. Appreciate you not giving us a question. <laughs> I always feel guilty because 
I had one time done a live stream and somehow missed like three or four because the scholar had to go. I got messages of like really upset people. And I was yeah. like, I never intend. I can't help that that happens. YouTube but. should you should should have a, a refundability because I also sometimes when I when I like you know with the Abraxas question, um, like when I just don't know, like at some level I want to have the ability to like offer a person a refund and they can accept it and if they want to make a donation great, but also don't like if I don't know the answer, I don't want them to have to pay for my I don't knows. Right. So I wish YouTube would give us a, a a little refund button where we could actually go through and refund at least some of them or or whatever. I don't know. I just it's like. I people think that uh, thus people that run channels are YouTube gods and can control everything, but you'd be surprised of how little uh, we have. We have control or like the, the ads on your channel. Like if I wanted to target channels to put ads of my own on them, I can. Oh. I have no say over who puts ads on the channel. There's so much we can get lost. Oh into. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I have like Jews for Jesus ads on my channel. It's like enraging. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> <laughs> Same here, man. And I'm like, oh, I yeah, it's like cringe. Like, do not want this so bad. So, well, yeah, they're just, but they're funding me. It's almost like the tithes that go to support them are supporting me. And I'm like, you know what? So be it then. If you want to help support what I'm doing, go for it. Robin, you know? Robin Hooding, we call that. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Sledge. And I appreciate everybody in the chat. And uh, final words from you? No, just uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for their questions and hanging out. Thank you. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more.